welcome back uh, to Rosa Luxemburg at 150, Revisiting Her Radical Life and Legacy, a uh, online symposium hosted by the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung and uh, the International Rosa Luxemburg Society. My name is Lauren from the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, and I'll be chairing uh, what is our closing keynote speech after two days of really fantastic panels with over 30 speakers from literally um, around the world. Uh, so before we start, I'd just like to say thanks again to everybody who contributed. Uh, we had people from Argentina, from China, from Korea, from Brazil, uh, from Germany, uh, the United States, Greece, really all over the place. Um, and I think uh, really did a great job to demonstrate both the depth and the breadth of uh, low Rosa Luxemburg's uh, contribution to Marxist theory and to what extent she's expired, inspired um, socialists and leftists um, around the world for, for generations. Uh, I'd also like to give a special thanks to two people who have not featured on the stream so much, um, but without whom we really couldn't have pulled off this event. Uh, that would be Ottokar Luban of the International Rosa Luxemburg Society who uh, more or less came up with the idea for this conference and was uh, indispensable in organizing um, everything and inviting all the speakers, as well as my colleague Wiebke Boyshausen from the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung who has been behind the scenes the last two days um, running the streams and making sure that the right person is on camera, et cetera. Uh, I think without her, we um, would have had uh, qu quite a few disasters uh, throughout the day. So thanks to both of them um, for being really the uh, uh, invisible hands behind the project. I know that there have been a couple of technical glitches here and there. Uh, some of the streams didn't start on time. We've gotten a couple messages from people that they uh, maybe missed a session because they couldn't find the video. Um, uh, I just want to reassure everybody that all the uh, today are available and can be seen on our Facebook page at uh, facebook.com slash global. Uh, click on the video tab and you'll find all of the events uh, that we've held so far. And at some point, uh, we'll be uh, posting uh, cleaned up versions of the panels on our YouTube channel as well. Um, there's also been people who've asked uh, if the individual transcripts or papers that were presented at the conference can be downloaded. Uh, not yet, but we will be publishing as many of the papers as we can on our website. That's www.rosalux.org in the coming days and weeks. Um, so just you know, keep, keep your eyes peeled. And as soon as we actually have them published, we'll also be um, uh, communicating that or, or publicizing that over our social media channels. So if you haven't already, follow us on uh, Twitter. Uh, the, the handle is rosalux underscore global uh, and Facebook rosalux global. Like uh, button. Um, one more project I would like to uh, draw attention to before uh, we move on to our closing, uh, closing keynote. Uh, it's been mentioned a couple times uh, throughout the conference, and in fact, several of the speakers uh, who spoke today and yesterday are involved in this project, and that is the Collected Works of Rosa Luxemburg, uh, which is uh, published by Verso Books in collaboration with the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung. Uh, uh, there have been two or three, but rather three volumes that have appeared three. thus far, um, with quite a few more planned. Uh, it's all of Rosa Luxemburg's books, pamphlets, essays, articles, her letters, and her manuscripts the vast majority of which have never appeared in English. And uh, it is sponsored by the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, but it's a big task and it costs a lot of money. And so we'd ask anyone who's interested in continuing to expand Rosa Luxemburg's reach and the availability of her, of her uh, writings in English to consider donating uh, uh, the link post in the chat on the Facebook stream in a minute. Um, but, uh, the, the website is the Toledo Translation Fund, and one of the projects is the Complete Works of Rosa Luxemburg. You can um, find the link if you go to that website. Uh, all right, with, uh, with that said, I've got nothing left to do but uh, to introduce our um, final speaker. We've saved the best for last, so to speak. Uh, our final speaker is Peter Hudis. Peter is a professor of humanities and philosophy at Oakton Community College in Chicago. He's also written and edited a number of books, including Franz Fanon, Philosopher of the Barricades, a collection of the writings of Marxist philosopher Raya Dunyaskaya. But uh, most importantly, or at least the reason that he's speaking with us today is because he's also the general editor of the aforementioned Complete Works of Rosa Luxemburg and has done more than um, probably anyone at this conference uh, 
to contribute to the popularization and spread of Rosa Luxemburg's uh, and in the English speaking world. Um, so we really appreciate him taking the time uh, to speak with us today. His topic, uh, which is also going to be in the spirit of applying Rosa Luxemburg's ideas to the world we live in today, is using Rosa Luxemburg to understand racialized capitalism. Peter will speak for about 30, 40 minutes, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions and comments. Uh, like we've said before, if you want to ask a question, just type it in the chat box and we'll make sure uh, that it gets to Peter. So yeah, thanks, Peter, and uh, take it away. OK, thank you very much, Lauren, and uh, looking forward to a good discussion on a very important topic. Uh, the mass protests against police abuse and for Black lives that engulf engulfed the United States and numerous other countries in the year 2020 pose a critical test as to whether radical theorists can account for the persistence of racism and new forms of subjective resistance that have arisen against it. The month-long series of marches, rallies, and other events that erupted following the police murder of George Floyd on May 25, 2020, was the largest series of continuous protests in the history of the United States, involving 26 million people participating in, over, in events in over 2,000 cities. And that continues today, this momentum, in a series of ongoing campaigns aimed at defunding police, aiding workers impacted by the ravages of COVID-19, and abolishing prisons and the criminal injustice system. Historical turning points, like the ones which characterize the protests of the last year, have a way of casting judgment, not just upon existing society, but upon the standpoints of those who have tried to oppose it. Most specifically, it renders increasingly anachronistic the claim that race-based politics detract from the class struggle or the fight against capitalism. Many of the young activists in today's anti-racist movements make no secret of the hostility to capitalism. Yet it is not the general class struggle that motivates them as much as capitalism's specifically racist character. This also, I should add, renders anachronistic versions of identity politics that put issues of class or anti-capitalism aside, uh, which does continue to dominate left-wing academic discourse. But in, from either side, it has become increasingly problematic to treat race, class, and gender as independent variables. So it's therefore only fitting that we conclude this conference by asking whether the work of Rosa Luxemburg speaks to these issues. Now, in doing so, I make no pretense that she can answer the problems of our time. Her life world was defined by the horizons of a socialist movement in the early 20th century in which issues of race and racism were either ignored or viewed as secondary to the class struggle. But as many present, pre, uh, presentations at this conference have shown, the multidimensionality of Luxembourg's life and work as a way of speaking to us across the historical barrier that divides our time from hers. So does her work in any way help us understand the nature of racialized capitalism? Now, before trying to turn directly to that question, I first want to uh, pose a, a serious problem, but actually I'm not posing it. It was posed uh, by the great uh, decolonial uh, scholar and philosopher Sylvia Winter in a statement that she made in the year 2015. And I quote, Sylvia Winter, this is her statement. Both before and during World War II, global anti-colonial and anti-apartheid uprisings, Marx's then prophetic, poetic, emancipatory project had been for so long the only ostensibly ecumenically human emancipatory project around. The result that many of us had thought that what first had to be transformed was above all, a present free market, free trade model of capitalist economic production exploitation system into a new socialist mode of production. The idea was that once this was done, everything else would follow, including taking down our still ongoing status hierarchically structured racist world systematic order of domination and subordination. This change was to automatically follow, but it didn't, of course, end quote. Now, Winter makes an extremely important point. There's a long history of equating capitalism with private ownership, unfettered markets, markets and freely contracted wage labor. It follows from this that socialism or communism is defined by nationalized property, central planning, and the abolition of labor markets. But is it really possible to address, adequately address race and racism within such a framework? 
Why assume that ending private ownership of the means of production in favor of a socially planned economy will undermine racism when the nationalization of property in the Soviet Union did not prevent racist and in some cases genocidal policies being imposed against Ukrainians, Jews, Crimean Tatars, and others. And yet from Luxembourg's time down to today, many assume that ending our free market, free trade economic model will quasi automatically lead to overcoming all forms of oppression, including racism and sexism. Now, as an example of this, I just want to quote from the 1903 program of the Russian Social Democratic Workers' Party, the party of Plekhanov and Lenin. And it was a program adopted at a conference that Rosa Luxemburg attended. She walked out of it in protest, but only because she objected to its support for national self-determination. The program stated, and I quote, by replacing private with public ownership of the means of production and exchange, by introducing planned organization into the public process of production, the social revolution of the proletariat will abolish the division of society into classes and thus emancipate all oppressed humanity and will terminate all forms of exploitation of one part of society by another, end quote. Now, that perspective defined the horizon of many socialists and communists for decades afterwards, even when the abolition of this so-called free market free trade model by supposedly Marxist regimes led not to a free association of the producers, but to various forms of statist capitalism. Even the new generation of revolutionaries born from the 1960s freedom struggles, which included a new left that initially wanted nothing to do with the frozen Marxism of the past, continued to define capitalism in terms of market anarchy and private ownership and socialism in terms of social planning and collective property. Indeed, many still do today, but it's hard to find Indeed, it's hard to find a leading public intellectual uh, in the socialist left in the Western world today that does not define socialism as the abolition of free markets and the enactment of a fair redistribution of surplus value, instead of as the creation of freely associated relations in and beyond the workplace that abolish the very existence of production for the sake of augmenting value or wealth in monetary form. It's hard to see how an anti-capitalist perspective can address the lived experience of people of color oh. if it fails to target the reified form of human praxis that defines our present existence. While a redistribution of value would surely benefit Blacks, Latinx, and Native Americans, speaking of the US, who experience capitalism's worst inequities, that does not by itself challenge racist attitudes and behaviors. There is no assurance that targeting neoliberalism, that is deregulated markets and privatization, challenges racialized ways of seeing and relating to others, especially since many who imbibe the norms of a racist society often includes progressive whites. Now in recent decades, a number of theorists, such as the German Neue Marx Lektor, the Japanese school of Kozo Uno, and the US theorist Moshe Paston, has challenged traditional Marxism's fixation on property forms in favor of challenging the domination of socially necessary labor time and the existence of value production. However, since these schools of thought presume that such abstract forms of domination efface human resistance to the value form, they are no more capable of addressing race and racism than the orthodox Marxists that they critique. So Marxism clearly faces a problem when it comes to the theorizing the integrality of racism and capital accumulation. For this reason, I think, in the last several decades, many critical race and post-colonial theorists um, have turned away from Marxism in favor of alternative approaches, whether by Foucault or other thinkers, none of which, in my view, point us towards developing an alternative to capitalism. Yet those committed to developing such an alternative need to put aside their defensiveness and acknowledge that part of the reason for the attraction of so-called identity politics is that post-Marx Marxism has largely relied upon a set of theoretical and practical assumptions that have proved incapable of accounting for the persistence of anti-Black racism or the lived experience of those combating it. It's surely not incidental that we have Marxist theories of politics, history, finance, culture, media, art, etc., 
but we're still lacking a strictly Marxian theory of racialization. So again, does the work of Rosa Luxemburg provide any assistance for working one out for today? Now, an especially important work which brings Luxembourg's thought to bear on racial capitalism, only appeared a few years ago, is Jackie Wang's book, Carceral Capitalism. It's a very impressive account of how Blacks and Latinos in the United States are impacted by mass incarceration and deadly forms of policing, as well as predatory lending, data-driven surveillance, and the racialization of debt. This makes newly relevant, Wang argues, Luxembourg's view that capitalism has a dual character, one sphere is governed by freedom of contract and the rule of law, while the other is dominated by political violence and looting carried out by hegemonic capitalist states. Capitalism depends, that is, on non-economic forms of coercion against colonized peoples and racial minorities as much as it does depend on contractual wage labor. Rather than casting slavery and native genocide as temporarily circumscribed events, that inaugurated the birth of capitalism in the new world, which is called primitive accumulation, Luxembourg's approach, she argues, shows how the racial logics produced by these processes persist to this day. She summarizes Luxembourg's relevance as follows, and I quote, what Rosa Luxembourg is describing in the accumulation of capital, her most important book, is a dual system whereby the liberal contract prevails in the temperate zone of the white race, while the labor supply in the extra capitalist social strata is secured through colonial domination and forms of soft power. A hybrid form emerges when capitalist social formations are grafted onto non-capitalist social formations. Luxembourg's arguments are relevant to debates about the birth of capitalism and ongoing accumulation, but they also help us analyze fictitious capital, financialization, and contemporary racial capitalism." End quote. Luxembourg therefore appears better positioned to provide an account of racial capitalism than Marx, whose formulas on expanded reproduction at the end of volume two of Capital assume a single isolated capitalist nation and whose discussion of the so-called primitive accumulation at the end of volume one treats non-economic forms of coercion as the exception rather than the rule in societies governed by contractual wage labor. Well, Wang has a compelling argument here. There are some problems with how she, as well as Luxembourg, frames the issue. The Marxist of the Second International read the section on the so-called primitive accumulation as a universal theory denoting the course of development for all times and places, instead of as a historical description of it in one time and place, England in the 16th century. Due to this misreading, they held that primitive accumulation is restricted to the distant origins of capitalism and no longer defines it. They concluded from this that since capitalism has outgrown its violent past, it can be changed through parliamentary means. Now, Luxembourg virently opposed this, as seen in her attack on Edward Bernstein. The misreading of Marx on primitive accumulation, however, also dovetailed with a tendency by some to turn a blind eye to imperialism on the grounds that capitalism will naturally outgrow its reliance on it. Luxembourg opposed that as well, as seen in her break with Kalkowski in 1910, over the Morocco incident. Now, Luxembourg was absolutely correct in her criticisms of Bernstein and Kowski, but she proceeded from the same premise as they, insofar as she also read Marx's discussion of primitive accumulation as a universal theory. The difference is that she criticized Marx for this, whereas her opponents did not. Few at the time asked if it is actually the case that Marx's discussion of primitive accumulation is a universal theory. They did not take into consideration that it might have it might take different expressions and modalities depending upon the historical context. Now, the oversight is, a is to a certain extent understandable since the writings of Marx in which he explicitly denied that his, theory, his discussion of primitive accumulation is a universal theory were not published until after their deaths. Moreover, what no one knew at the time is that Marx devoted much of the last 15 years of his life after publishing volume one of Capital to determine the extent to which so-called primitive accumulation is an ongoing and continuing process as seen in its impact on the non-Western world, which he explored in a series of studies of Russia, China, India, Indonesia, Muslim North Africa, Southern Africa, Australia, the First Nations peoples of the Americas, et cetera, in the years following the publication of Capital. 
These writings that have only appeared in recent decades analyze the violent dispossession of native peoples from their lands and the commodification of their labor power and as, as an essential condition for the expansion of capitalism. Indeed, a major reason for Marx's failure to complete volumes two and three of Capital by the time of his death is that he was still in the process of absorbing and analyzing these developments, which would no doubt have been as important for the later volumes of Capital as England and West Europe was for volume one. Now, Luxembourg cannot be blamed for not knowing any of this since the materials the, uh, were not published at the time. But it's hard to be as charitable to contemporary figures who continue to argue that Marx held that violent dispossession, AK primitive accumulation, applies only to the distant European origins of capitalism, despite much evidence to the contrary. But even if we were to put this aside, there are big problems with Luxembourg's critique of Marx's discussion of primitive accumulation. Primitive accumulation refers to the complete separation between laborers and the ownership of the objective conditions for the realization of their labor. That is, it is nothing else than the historical process of divorcing the producer from the means of production. This violent separation of the producer from the means of production makes wage labor, generalized wage labor possible. But generalized wage labor is not the only possible outcome of primitive accumulation. Africans who were forced into the transatlantic slave trade were violently torn from any organic connection to the conditions for the realization of their own labor in Africa, but they did not become wage slaves, but rather chattel slaves, unlike in 16th century England. Yet according to Marx, their labor augmented capital and proved of pivotal importance in capitalism development. So allow me just to quote briefly here from uh, what Marx had to say about this. I quote Marx himself. In the second type of colonies, plantations, where commercial speculations figure from the start and production is intended for the world market, the capitalist mode of production exists, although in a formal sense, since the slavery of blacks precludes free wage labor, which is the basis of capitalist production. But the business in which slaves are used is conducted by capitalists. The method of production which they introduce has not arisen out of slavery, but is grafted onto it. In this case, the same person is capitalist and landowner, that is the master, and the elemental existence of the land confronting capital and labor does not offer any resistance to capital investment since none, and hence none, to the competition between capitals." End quote. Now, does this mean that the violent dispossession of people of color, that people of color experience in capitalism today is an instantiation of primitive accumulation? It's hard to claim this in light of the fact that African-Americans were long separated from the conditions of production, such as the land, and, since the, and because since the end of slavery, the vast majority have been employed as wage laborers. That black Americans were the first to suffer deindustrialization long before the term gained uh, widespread currency, uh, it, uh, uh, and that a disproportionate number of blacks face underemployment and even permanent unemployment is not a sign of primitive accumulation. It's rather the the so a sign of the logic of mature capitalism in which the domination of dead labor or capital over living labor at the point of production looms so large as to reduce the proportion of living labor relative to capital. As the last hired and first fired, blacks find that their labor power and even their lives no longer matter in the eyes of capital. And yet it is precisely this domination of dead over living labor, which leads to a massive displacement of workers from the process of production that is obscured and occluded by Rosa Luxemburg's argument in the accumulation of capital. Let me now try to show this briefly. Despite the brilliance of her book, The Accumulation of Capital, in delineating, as she puts it, how capital needs other races to exploit territories where the white race is not capable of working, Luxembourg did not grasp the level of abstraction employed in Marx's analysis of the logic of capital in volume two of Capital. The formulas are ex on expanded reproduction at the end of that volume is not a description of how capital accumulation occurs in the real world. It is an abstract model that temporarily brackets out issues like foreign trade, non-capitalist sectors and realization crises, 
in order to illuminate what Marx considered the central issue in expanded reproduction, the domination of dead over living labor. Now Wang, in her book, underlines this critical point. So let me quote Wang again. She writes, critics of Marx who have taken up Cedric Robinson's hermeneutic of racial capitalism contest Marx's division of people in a capitalist society into the universal class-based categories of workers and capitalists. However, this critique misses that in texts other than capital, particularly in Marx's historical and journalistic writings, Marx writes about a complex cast of characters that cannot be reduced solely to capitalists and workers. Remember in Capital, she writes, she adds, Marx presents us with, an, with abstract models as a way to critique classical political economy. And so those models should not be taken as empirical descriptions of reality. Luxembourg, however, ties Marx's alleged failure to discuss primitive accumulation as an ongoing process in volume one to his alleged failure to account for capitalism's dependence on non-capitalist strata in the developing world in volume two. But she's mixing up two different issues marked by two different levels of abstraction. The section on primitive accumulation describes a contingent historical process, whereas the formulas on expanded reproduction is a highly abstract mathematical model that is not intended as an empirical description of reality. At issue here is not some scholastic hair splitting. At issue is whether Luxembourg's approach provides an alternative to the difficulties many Marxists have faced in theorizing race and racism. The central issue in Luxembourg's critique of Marx in the accumulation of capital is how expanded reproduction of capital is possible. Given that capitalism always generates a greater mass and value of the surplus product than can be consumed by wage earners or capitalists. Since the law of value is a disciplining mechanism that forces producers to generate more output in less amounts of time, while at the same time suppressing wage increases in favor of profits, a disproportion between production and consumption is built into the very innards of the system. So how is expanded reproduction even possible? That's the question. Luxembourg holds that the answer boils down to for whom, for whom is a surplus product destined? Whereas for Marx, it boils down to for what, for what is it destined? Let me show as follows. Marx argues that what drives capitalism is production for the sake of production. That is augmenting capital as an end in itself. He therefore abstracts from factors extraneous to capitalism to show that capital grows big with value by productively consuming constant capital. Dead labor or capital increases at a faster rate relative to living labor. The means of production dominate means of consumption. This, however, does not free capitalism of its disproportionalities, but just shifts them onto a higher level since the system responds by investing in ever more machinery and ever more technology. Luxembourg denied, however, that this is how expanded reproduction actually occurs, arguing that the real issue is not, that for her arguing that the real issue is who, not what, but who can realize the value of the surplus product. Since, the adequate, since, an adequate since an adequate level of purchasing power cannot be supplied by wage earning, cap uh, wage earning workers or capitalists, it can only derive, she argues, from third groups in non-capitalist societies. This is the crux of her effort to show that imperialism is necessary for capitalism. It's not an accident, it's not a political policy, it's a necessary ingredient for the very existence of capitalism. Now, her argument is logical, it's coherent, and it's highly attractive, especially in showing how and why capitalism is driven to take over and destroy indigenous social formations and peoples in the non-Western world. But the argument leads her to overlook a, a rather important determinant that has some pretty serious consequences. Since Luxembourg posed the contrast of capitalist versus non-capitalist strata as the key to expand the reproduction, she downplayed the importance of the domination of means of production over means of consumption. Indeed, she asserts in the accumulation of capital, and I quote her directly here, this is Rosa speaking, the growth in constant capital at the expense of variable capital is merely, merely the capitalist expression of the general effects 
are the increasing productivity of labor. The formula C or constant capital is greater than V variable capital translated from capitalist language to that of the social labor process means no more than this. She says, the greater the productivity of labor, the shorter the time needed to transform a given quantity of means of production into finished products. So it's simply a technical fact, she says, or contends, that characterizes not just capitalism, but any form of developed society, including the future socialist society. As she puts it, and I quote, this is the expression of the universal absolute condition of social production in all, that's her phrase, all its historical forms, end quote. So what to Marx is a specific and defining feature of capitalism, the domination of debt over living labor, becomes for Luxembourg merely the, ex merely the expression of a universal feature of human development. Hence, for all of her objections to Marx's unfinished and incomplete formulas of expanded reproduction at the end of volume two of capital, she holds that they can be applied to the planned system of production that supposedly defines socialism. As Tadusz Kowalik put it in his important uh, study of the accumulation of capital, the Polish Marxist, he wrote, quote, I'm quoting uh, Kowalik, Rosa Luxemburg was the only economist known to me who recognized the universal, common, supra-capitalist character and significance of this theoretical construct, the domination of debt over living labor and means of production over means of consumption before the First World War. And what is perhaps more important, that these schemes would be applicable to the socialist economy, end quote. In light of the tragic history and outright disasters associated with what called itself socialism in the 20th century, this can hardly be considered a compliment. The domination of means of production over means of consumption, of dead labor over living labor, is not some technical matter. It's the capitalist law of value expressed in material terms. Now, starting in the 1940s, in East Europe and in the USSR, various theoreticians, such as Vasily Leontiev and Oskar Langa, sought to apply Marx's formulas of expanded reproduction to a task never envisioned by Marx, the effort to plan a so-called socialist society. It was a complete disaster. Augmenting the means of production at the expense of consumer goods, driving the living standards of wide swaths of the population, especially the peasantry, beneath subsistence levels in the name of rapid industrialization, outright genocidal policies against subject minorities in places like Ukraine who got in the way of these harebrained schemes. This and more was the price paid for presuming that Marx's formulas at the end of volume two of Capital applies to socialism. The Soviet architects of this brutal process, which killed 20 million people, by the way, called it primitive socialist accumulation. Why is it that many post-colonial theorists take Marx to task for supposedly restricting primitive accumulation to the distant origins of capitalism in Western Europe, but almost never mention a much more recent instantiation of primitive accumulation, namely Stalin's forced industrialization of the Soviet Union. Rosa Luxemburg cannot be held responsible for the crimes committed by what called itself socialism and communism over the past 100 years. She was a virulent critic of authoritarianism, elitism, and statism, and would never for a moment have considered the regimes established by Stalin, Mao, and their successors as socialists. If she issued so sharp a critique of Lenin in 1918 for a suppression of democracy after his seizure of power, imagine how much more strident would be her attack on the later leaders of the USSR and the socialist bloc, who were immeasurably worse than Lenin. Every fiber of her being would have gone into opposing them, just as was the case when it came to our opposition to capitalism. Nevertheless, the central claim of the accumulation of capital, that expanded reproduction depends on exploiting non-capitalist societies, is precisely what prevents her economic theory from addressing today's realities. It is rather clear that the entire world today is capitalist and has been so for some time. So how is it possible, according to her theory, that expanded reproduction can still be occurring? History takes its toll on theory and theoreticians. It has often been said that a serious theoretician thinks out the logic of an idea to its ultimate conclusion. Rosa Luxemburg was clearly a serious theoretician. 
But you know, it's also been said that if you think out the logic, ultimate logical conclusion of a correct premise, you'll be known as a genius. Whereas you think out, if you think out and accept the ultimate logical conclusion of an incorrect premise, we won't use the word, but you'll be called something else. <laughs> the accumulation of capital is a brilliant demonstration of taking the logic of an idea out to its ultimate conclusion. Unfortunately, the conclusion shows that the premises were faulty. So I think we're now in the position to draw the threads of this discussion by evaluating whether Luxembourg's economic writings are capable of providing a framework in which to grasp racialized capitalism in general and the relation of class, race, and gender in particular. Luxembourg's failure to grasp the historical specificity of Marx's critique of the domination of debt over living labor is a serious matter. For it signifies that her theory of expanded reproduction failed to keep its pulse on the failed to keep its fingers on the pulse of human relations. Her emphasis on the market at the expense of social relations of production led her to fall far short of the humanism that characterizes so many other aspects of her life and work. It's not enough to point out that racism is integral to capitalism, which she did. The crucial issue is grasping the specific texture of racial oppression and the subjectivity of the revolts that arise against it. Luxembourg was so overburdened by the, by the phenomenal expressions of imperialism that she neglected the essence, the way in which the ever-growing domination of means of production over means of consumption produces a dehumanized form of human praxis that defines life in the era of capitalism. Race cannot be reduced to class. As Franz Fanon wrote, and I quote, Jean-Paul Sartre forgets that the black man experiences his body quite differently than the white man, end quote. Black consciousness is not a weak stage that is supplanted by class consciousness. If you believe that, you're out of luck. You, you know, history has left the station, the train has left the station a long time ago and you've missed it. Nor can sexism be reduced to class. Racism and sexism are particular, though different, expressions of human relations that take on the form of relations between things. Each must be understood and targeted on their own terms in a non-reductive matter, manner. However, to overlook the historical specificity of the reification involved in the domination of debt over living labor hardly makes room for a viable theory of racialization, since, as Fanon showed, racism is rooted in the white gaze, which sees and relates to Blacks not as persons, but as things who inhabit a zone of non-being. Racism is not epiphenomenal. It not only reflects, but constructs reified social relations that perpetrate and reproduce the capitalist mode of production. It is hard to see how any anti-capitalist perspective can succeed, let alone anti-capitalist revolution, without directly targeting such relations of personal, I emphasize personal domination. As Rai Dunievskaya, Marxist humanist philosopher once argued, I quote her, it is not the means of production that creates the new type of humanity, but the new type of humanity that will create the new means of production. Despite the unfinished state of Marxist capital, it shows, if we read it carefully, I think, that the fundamental problem is not private property or the market, but the way in which the law of value compels human relations to take the form of relations between things. Only a Marxism that focuses on this, the peculiar form of social labor that characterizes societies governed by value production, only a Marxism that is a humanism has a chance of meeting the challenge of our times. We need to think, comrades, and think critically about where the logic of our, of our ideas leads us. Luxembourg herself never broke from the traditional definitions of capitalism and socialism that I criticized at the start of this talk. Her economic writings from the industrial development of Poland to the introduction to political economy and from the accumulation of capital to the anti-critique pose the absolute opposites as market anarchy versus planned production. We can hardly blame her for that. Almost everyone else did the same at the time. Her generation did not know the fullness of Marx's Marxism since so much of his work from the 1844 Paris manuscripts to the Grinriser and from the drafts of capital to the ethnological notebooks were unknown to them. It's not as if had they been known all problems would have been solved. But what Marx does is indispensable. He provides a critique of capital that shows that the domination of capital 
centers on subjecting individuals to the drive to augment wealth in monetary form as an end in itself. At the same time as showing this, he never takes it, he never loses sight of the human resistance to such abstract forms of domination that are embedded within those social forms of domination. The resistance comes from within. As I have argued elsewhere, implicit in Marx's critique of capital, I argue this in my book, Marx's concept of the alternative to capitalism, embedded in Marx's critique of capital is a concept of an alternative to capitalism that reaches quite far beyond the standpoint of post-Marx Marxism. Luxembourg was surely correct that the market and private ownership of the means of production stand in the way of the free association of the producers. But their abolition, while necessary, is not sufficient. Abolishing the free market or private ownership of the means of production provide no assurance that a new society based on a free association will arise so long as alienated forms of labor and life that served as the, as the condition for the possibility of the market and private property remain to be uprooted. So coming to an end now, although Luxembourg's economic theories do not point us in the right direction, that's not the case with her political writings and practice as a revolutionary, which continues to shine like a jewel. She directly speaks to us in not refraining from critiquing both reformist and revolutionary currents that stand in the way of a thoroughly democratic socialism. She did not oppose participating in bourgeois parliaments and repeatedly insisted that a democratic republic is the formation best suited for waging the class struggle to a successful conclusion. However, beginning with her polemic with Bernstein and continuing with her debates with Kautsky, she took issue with the presupposition that the institutions of bourgeois society can be counted upon to forge the transition to socialism. This did not stop her from voicing equally strong opposition to revolutionaries who adopted authoritarian methods, such as are seen in her critique of Lenin, which is voiced in many, many places in her work, especially in her 1918 booklet on the Russian Revolution, which criticized Lenin and Trotsky for suppressing democracy, imposing a single party state, and banning left-wing organizations. Her support of the Bolshevik seizure of power and opposition to efforts to overturn it did not lead her to mute her criticisms of it, even as they were in the midst of fighting a bloody civil war against imperialism. As seen in her brutally realistic assessment, I quote Luxembourg, it is clear that under such conditions, that is being caught in the pincers of the imperialist powers on all sides, neither socialism nor the dictatorship of the proletariat can become a reality in Russia, but at most a caricature of both, end quote. And boy, would she ever write. She rejected any project of a social alternative that does not obtain the explicit consent of the majority of the exploited masses. This is the rose that lives on and speaks to a, the, the thoroughly democratic and grassroots movements of our time, especially those that, are, that have arisen in the course of the last year. She did not view democracy as a mere tool to be used to gain power, but as indispensable for fostering social consciousness and revolutionary initiative, both before and after power. And not least, of course, is her remarkable personality, which has inspired generations. As a Polish Jewish disabled woman, she had to claw her way to the top in order to become recognized as one of the leading Marxist theoreticians of the time. It's a testament to her strident and original personality, which is evident from a voluminous correspondence in which she insisted on not separating the personal from the political, the intellectual from the emotional, the theoretical from the practical. Now I venture to suggest that were Luxembourg alive, if, if Luxembourg were to be alive today, she would be thrilled with the movement against police abuse and for black lives, and would plunge into trying to understand it and generalize its accomplishments as much as she did for the 1905 Russian Revolution. Under its impact, she insisted that the working class, the German working class needed, as she put it, to learn how to speak Russian. Perhaps she would have responded to the protests of the past year by arguing that the rest of the world needed to learn how to speak African-American. This is not as far-fetched as it may sound, given the comment of one of our most critical and appreciative commentators, Raya Dunievskaya, who wrote the following in 1976. It's the last quote I'll give you. She wrote, Dunievskaya, to grasp the black dimension is to learn a new language, the language of thought, black thought. For many, this new language will be difficult because they are hard of hearing. 
hard of hearing because they are not used to this type of thought, a language which is both a struggle for freedom and the thought of freedom, end quote. Today's anti-racist movements pose a critical challenge to rethink the assumptions that have guided the theoretical and practical approaches of Marxism since Marx. Developing a viable alternative to capitalism, which has never been more important than today, may well depend upon it. What stands in the way of theorizing and grasping and organizing based upon the dialectical relationship between race, class, and gender are not the differing demands that arise from these loci of struggle, but rather a narrow vision of politics that fails to address what is, in sh what is shared in different ways by each of them, resistance to the dehumanization that is integral to actually existing capitalism. Marxism is a revolutionary humanism or it is nothing. The point is not to argue over whose oppression is more or less important than another's, but to hear, to hear how each voice of revolt contains within itself the capacity to reach for a new society, freed from dehumanization and depersonalization. As the philosopher Louis Laval wrote long ago, and I quote, so I was wrong, I do have one more quote, but this is from Louis Laval, 1946. Quote, philosophy and life have only had a serious character on the condition that the absolute is not before me and outside of me as an inescapable goal, but on the contrary is in me. And in that I can trace my furrow. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Peter, for a uh, tour de force of a, a closing keynote speech. Uh, a lot to unpack there. Um, we've got some time for questions and comments. I just want to uh, remind uh, viewers that if you want to ask Peter a question, go ahead and type it in the, um, in the chat box and uh, we'll make sure he, he hears it. Peter, I, I wanted to actually start with uh, um, uh, perhaps a, a simpler question, not a simpler question, but a, a clarification, um, uh, maybe for listeners who aren't um, quite as familiar with the Marxist and Luxembourgian theory as you are, because, and because it played a large role in contribution. Could you just on pretty quickly what you mean when you talk about the preponderance or the domination of dead over living labor or the means of mm -hmm. production over the means of consumption? Mm -hmm. Well, the simplest way to say it is perhaps the most immediate, the domination of machine over the person, right? Uh, where you're at a work process where you're no longer in control of your process of activity, but the machine, whether it be an industrial device or a computer is actually controlling you. Many of us have those type of jobs, right? Where uh, I'll give you an example of uh, adjunct lecturers in the city of Chicago are required to have office hours. Now the administration requires you to make sure you have for your 60 minute office hour you must show that you're always taken up with meetings in, by, with students in those 60 minutes. You can't be doing anything of your own work, right? Or anything just, you know, just relaxing or resting or having a sandwich. The computer records how many students and for how long amount of time you're meeting with them. In other words, the domination of dead over living labor has to do with an external force, a product of labor, capital, which takes the form of machines, computers, whatever, that control and stifle and shape your process of laboring. But the domination of dead over living labor doesn't only have to take that kind of material embodiment, which anybody who's worked in a factory, of course, knows this very, very well, right? Where you're literally made into a cog of a, of a machine, but we're increasingly subjected to an abstract form of this domination insofar as what? We're governed to produce so much in so much amount of time. And capitalism always drives you to produce more in less time. There is this time determinant that actually is the vehicle by which this domination of dead over living labor is imposed upon us. Great. Uh, now we have a question about Sylvia Winter. Uh, namely, where in her work does Sylvia Winter make explicit reference to Luxembourg and how important is Luxembourg for Winter's theorization on coloniality and decolonization, decolonization, excuse me. Yeah, that's a great question. And it's a question I, I'm not sure I can give you the correct answer to uh, because uh, Sylvia is an amazingly diverse thinker. She's written so much, I'm still trying to catch up with her. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, I, I quote it here from a, a, an interview with her, which runs, what, 80 pages? 
Uh, this is a person who was a philosopher, literary critic, political activist. I mean, there's so many other areas of her work, a novelist, etc. Um, I do. I have come across references to Luxembourg in uh, Sylvia Winter, and they're, they're appreciative references. I haven't sat found any really in depth discussion, but she was. Uh, she's from the Caribbean. She's part of that creolized Marxism that was a subject of one of the panels here uh, uh, yesterday, and uh, she somebody who experienced various dimensions of the radical left in the Caribbean, but then increasingly began, as she put it, when I would stop my, my Marxist colleagues and start to talk about the question of race, they kind of like cut the discussion off and leave the room, as if like I was diverting the discussion from the real issue. And it, that's what makes a lot of people walk away from the, so, well, what we, let's call it the white left, <laughs> okay? Um, so uh, she was somebody who retain a commitment to principles of Marxism, but she also realized that the, the, the Marxism of her time, at least, uh, did not make room for her own subjectivity. Uh, and I, I think that she would have problem finding Lux room for her own subjectivity within Luxembourg herself for that reason. Not the Luxembourg of the political writings, not Luxembourg the personality, but as it was stated in the panel just before this one, Luxembourg's economic writings were considered by her her most important theoretical writings. But if her most important theoretical writings uh, don't take account of a fundamental dimension that actually could be used to account for racialized capitalism, there's gonna be a barrier there. I just end by saying the big problem we have is that people judge Marxism by various Marxists. Uh, and the way that Marxism becomes vulgarized is very often the way people judge Marx and read it back into Marx, which is not to say Marx get everything right. He got some things wrong. Or, or a lot of things that were just incomplete or unfinished in Marx's work. But the point is, is that um, that's, I think, uh, she was trying to go beyond the, stale, the, the kind of the, uh, the stasis that had been reached with the Marxism of her time. Great, we have a quick question, but I'm gonna ask it now before I forget. Yeah, I'm not uh, hearing you, Lauren. Okay, now I am. Okay, sorry. Yeah, it uh, took me a minute there to hit the mute button. Uh, question, but get it. Uh, could you repeat the name of the last author you quoted? Someone in the chat would like to look that, that person up. Louis it's, Laval. It's text from a, yeah. It's uh, Louis, Vala, uh, Louis Laval. Uh, it's a book in French, The Act, uh, 1946. There's one or two of his books in English. Uh, he was a very early French existentialist. This is before even Sartre was doing his work in the early 1930s. Uh, not a Marxist at all, uh, but he was doing very interesting work that it influenced some of the later existentialists, including Sartre uh, and Meloponti and others. And of course, Meloponti was the teacher of Franz Fanon, so there's an indirect connection there. Um, and he's pretty much completely neglected in the English speaking world. How I learned about Louis Laval was I discovered that. Franz Fanon owned some of his books in his library. This has recently been discovered in the publication of his library. So I said, gee, Fanon was reading this guy, Louis Laval, who is that? So I did a little research and there's some interesting things in there. That actually brings me uh, to a question I wanted to ask you. Um, I think you gave a, well, you made a very convincing case that Rosa Luxemburg is not a particularly useful Marxist when it comes to understanding um, uh, contemporary racism or the, the structures and the, uh, uh, the Funktionsweise, as we would say in German, of contemporary racism. But you're also someone who's worked on uh, and written an entire book about Franz Fanon. And I was wondering if you could say a few words about uh, how his thinking could figure into a Marxist understanding of racism today. Ah, very good. Well, first of all, I want to clarify, I'm not saying Luxembourg's work does not help us uh, understand racism or racialized capitalism. Uh, because I'm, as I was uh, suggesting in my uh, discussion of, um, of, of Wang's book, there's a lot of ways in which, especially part three of the accumulation of capital, explicitly and implicitly does relate and speaks to the realities of racial capitalism. Um, the problem is, is that the argument by which she constructed that work leads in theoretically in a direction that can't provide the foundation for an adequate theory of racialization from a Marxian perspective. Those are two different things. 
So it's one thing to say, well, I, I, this thinker has some insights here and insights there that are really valuable that I can use in my own struggle. And we, there's all kinds of people we read for that. I mean, you don't just read Marx for that, right? You can read all kinds of uh, individuals. Like the example I just gave, Louis Laval is nowhere near Marxism, but he's got this beautiful expression, at least I found it kind of beautiful, that I closed my talk with, that I learned a lot from, and I, you, can, you can utilize that. But I would never argue that Louis Laval's actual philosophical position is something that speaks to realities of police abuse or, <laughs> or the struggle to defund police or the struggle to eliminate the prison industrial complex, uh, far from it. Um, Luxembourg's vision of freedom does speak to today's movements against police abuse and uh, defund, uh, defunding police. Why? Because he had a vision of a thoroughly free and democratic society. Now, can you have, first of all, capitalism without police? If you're saying defund the police and abolish the police, what you're implicitly saying is there can't be any more capitalism. Because even if you eliminated the police tomorrow in a formal sense, well, what would happen? The owners of capital or businesses would simply hire their own private police forces, which by the way is how policing in the United States started out to begin with, right? Pinkertons, private guards, Robert Ovetz knows a lot about this, uh, who actually you know, protected their property. You cannot have uh, capitalism without the protection of property rights and you can't have the protection of property rights without some form of militarized policing. So when these young activists say defund and abolish the police, it's not an accident that they want to know about, hey, what are theorists that tell me what's, how to get out of capitalism? Because they can see that connection. That connection is becoming more and more visible. Okay, so it's not to say there aren't certain liberals that jump on the bandwagon and say, oh yes, I'm for that too. But you'll notice in the last couple of months, a lot of the liberals are jumping off the bandwagon, saying, oh, we didn't really mean to defund the police. We meant cut by 5%, uh, no, no, no. So I just want to make that clear that I'm not suggesting that Luxembourg's work does not help us at all in understanding racialized capitalism. I'm saying the frame of the argument in her accumulation of capital does not do so. And if I, the reason I'm making that point is that unfortunately, those who have good intentions who are trying to relate Luxembourg's ideas to the realities of today's racialized capitalism, I think are barking up the wrong tree by uncritically accepting the frame of her argument in accumulation of capital, thinking that's going to, so to speak, be the thing that makes the connection when it actually leads in a direction that's contrary to where we need to go. Now, just briefly on Franz Fanon, I've written a lot about this and Jacobin just recently published a short piece of mine and also did an interview for Jacobin Radio discussing the importance of Fanon's work. The most important part of Fanon is, and uh, by the way, Sylvia Winter's work is brilliant in, in really have brought, drawing this out of Fanon, she was a Fanonian, is sociogenesis. Race is not um, a biological phenomenon. We all have talked about this as race is socially constructed, but it was Fanon who gave the most prominent and powerful argument that race is an arbitrary social construction. And it's not that race that produces racism, but racism that produces race. And that fundamental problem of racism, as Fanon argued, is that it's not simply a question of, you know, unequal distribution of economic resources, which of course happens through rape because of racism, or the lack of adequate political representation by people of color, which of course is central to the problem of racism. But Fanon didn't focus on that alone. Focus, Fanon focused on the most immediate person-to-person -person interaction what happens when the white gazes at the person of color, unaware of all the racial stereotypes and prejudices that have been passed down ever since the transatlantic slave trade about people of color and reproduces that in their social interactions with those individuals. He had an amazing sensitivity to that problem. And what I'm arguing is that we have to tackle the problem of racism on both levels, the socioeconomic and political, right? Yes, and Fanon says so himself, but we also have to tackle it on the form of intersubjective communication and relationships. To say that I'm a Marxist and therefore I can't be a racist, I'm sorry, that doesn't cut it, okay? We've had plenty of Marxists who uh, have a long history of sexual abuse, okay? We could talk about some things happened in the left in the last year about this and going on right now. We have a lot of Marxists who have shown lack of sensitivity to people of color, even in, in their own radical organizations and still haven't gotten the message that, hey, you know, white privilege is just not a word, it's actually a reality, okay? So we have to combat on both levels, the socioeconomic, also on the interpersonal and psychological level, because racism 
takes on, as Fanon argued, it has economic roots. And he argued it was a transatlantic slave trade. He didn't think anti-Black racism existed before the 1500s, and I think he was right about that. Anti-Black racism emerges with the transatlantic slave trade, but once, and it, that's an economic imperative that produces that racism, the drive for extracting resources from, his, uh, from Black bodies that you don't have to pay. Uh, but he said, though it has its origins in the economics, it takes on, racism takes on a life of its own and is not reducible to its origins. And it percolates and permeates for centuries, even after the abolition of slavery. And it serves as the fulcrum of reproducing alienated social relationships, which is what capitalism lives off of and strives and, and, and so not only lives on, but it prospers upon. Great. Uh... Thanks for setting me straight. <laughs> uh, we got another uh, great question from the chat that I want to read for you. Uh, it says, uh, this was a great talk, especially for those studying the history of the Soviet Union as a critique of political economy. Uh, the transformation of the Soviet economy in the 1990s, um, if it was from state capitalism, then to what? Can shock therapy reforms, i.e. neoliberalization, be considered an on or can be considered ongoing so-called primitive accumulation or expropriation or not, since the focus, have you pointed, as you pointed out, has been wrongly placed on private versus public property rather than alienation. Thank you for that question. That's a great question. Uh, I don't. I think that the, the uh, effort to dismantle the nationalized property of the Soviet Union and their uh, planned economy to the extent they had one, it was not a very well planned one, by the way. <laughs> uh, but the point, the, the effort to destroy that in one fell swoop, as you all know, had a tremendously negative impact. That was not a step forward. Replacing one type of capitalism for another type of capitalism does not bring you to nirvana. And in that case, it drove down living standards and life expectancy enormously in the Soviet Union after 91 through the shock therapy. And that was a terrible, terrible thing. Uh, but um, that's not primitive accumulation because primitive accumulation, it, it, the term means something very specific. The, the separation of the labor from the soil or other organic meat or other a connection to other organic conditions of production. You tear literally the person away, you force that peasant off the land uh, and you force, compel them to move to the cities and work in the factories. You could say that to a large extent, China's going through that for the last 30 years. But that's not Soviet Union after 1991, because that was already achieved under Stalin, that tearing away of the peasants. Literally, they tore them away, right? That's why so many died in the process uh, to, to build up. And they, they did so deliberately to build up a class of wage laborers. So no, uh, the shock therapy was not primitive accumulation. I'm glad you're asking the question, though, because there's a lot of confusion about this. David Harvey, as many of you know, is a very important thinker. He's got a lot of insights. I don't agree with him a lot of things, but I read what he says, and I always get something out of him. But he's developed, based on his reading of Luxembourg, he understands that uh, uh, this notion that primitive accumulation is restricted to the early origins of capitalism and that alone, well, that doesn't explain what's going on in the world today. From, so there's a gap in Marxism. So he tries to make up for it by using Rosa Luxemburg's critique of Marx and refashing it in, refashing in it into a concept called accumulation by dispossession. Uh, and he applies that, for instance, to what happened in the Soviet Union after 91, et cetera, and many, many other places in the world. And of course, he says that's the essence of neoliberalism. But there's a problem with Harvey's approach. It stays within the traditional Marxist perspective insofar as accumulation by dispossession for Harvey means privatization. But uh, as I mentioned in my talk, what about forms of state control of, uh, uh, that imposes onerous racist conditions upon minorities that are not related to privatization, that are actually, th that, I mean, the so, uh, police are generally public agencies, <laughs> okay? Uh, the criminal injustice system, yes, prisons are privatized, in cre there's a privatized prisons in the US, but they're like 5% of the prisons. The vast majority of prisons in the United States are not privatized. They're state run. They're state, this is a part of state capital, okay? So if you just focus on privatization or you mainly focus on privatization, yeah, you can explain a number of things. And there is a drive for privatization, which is very, very egregious and deleterious, but you're not getting the whole picture. And especially you're not getting the whole picture when it comes to what's happening in terms of racism. 
Well, Peter, we're almost out of time, but I'd like to close with, uh, with a question I wanted to ask. Um, we've talked about Luxembourg's theory of uh, her economic theories. You've also talked about um, uh, Luxembourg's uh, theorization and understanding of democracy as a political tool. Um, I wanted to, when we're talking about the, uh, the current political moment and maybe the way that Luxembourg can relate to it, our last panel um, uh, talked a lot about Luxembourg's theory of the mass strike. And um, we're, you know, we're coming out of a period as you open your talk with, uh, when we had a massive, ex an explosion really of, of anti-racist protests and struggle last year in the United States um, that uh, at least plenty of researchers have argued was probably the largest um, demonstration or protest movement or uprising in American history. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering thing about Luxembourg's theory of the mass strike, her writings on the mass strike, and to what extent, if any, those can help us uh, think about and theorize uh, what happened last summer in the United States and what may, uh, who knows, happen again soon. Right. I mean, uh, great question. Thank you for that. I mean, it, these weren't mass strikes. These were mass protests. But in some cases, they did take the form of kind of mass strikes, right? People walked out of work. They didn't, or they weren't, they had to work at home and they left home in the middle of a pandemic uh, to join protests uh, that, and these, would, and there was no party around organizing them. Okay. Now you can say that's shows that it's not going to go anywhere. But you know that all too knowing look of old radicals uh, doesn't get us very far in politics. Uh, to give you an example, uh, a few days after the protests really exploded in Chicago, and they were in the south side of Chicago, in the African American community, to some degree in the west side, uh, largely Latino, but there was also a very big protest downtown uh, in the Chicago Loop. Uh, somebody puts out on the uh, living on the north side, which is predominantly white, but there's blacks and Latinos living on the north side, but it's predominantly white area. Liberals, but you know, liberal politically generally votes, but uh, whatever that means in, in Chicago politics. But the point of the matter is, is that somebody posts on their Facebook page, hey, why don't we have a meeting? If actually it was in Boys Town, they, they say, let's pick up the, uh, in the gay neighborhood, Boys Town, Belmont and Sheffield. How come they're having rallies in the south side? But there's no rallies happening on the north side. Hey, I got an idea. Why don't we just, my, those people were involved in a protest. Let's meet tomorrow at 12 noon at Belmont and Sheffield, right? So I go down there to see what's up, okay? And I'm thinking like, well, how many people are gonna show up? I mean, 300, it's only 24 hours. It was put on Facebook and this is the north side, right? I mean, you know, come on now. Uh, 6,000 people are there. When I get there, half an hour early. Okay, <laughs> so how did that happen? I mean, so, and there's like constant again and again and again and again for the next four or five months. I mean, there were days where there was like six or seven protests that just were announced. I can't even say they were planned. People are just announcing them and thousands of people show up in different parts of the city. And then they start marching. And sometimes the marches end up accidentally or sometimes through social media converging together. And, uh, and some of these involve like at marches in the south side of Chicago, like march down you know, 79th Street and Cottage Grove. This is an area that's 100% African-American. You know, this is not a place where whites generally go. If you see a white walking down the street generally, they're either you know, a, a cop or they're a drug, or somebody looking to buy drugs. I'm sorry to say, I mean, this is an incredibly segregated city. And yet there's a rally that that's called, thousands of people show up, a third, a third of the crowd is white. African-Americans are coming out of their building saying, wow, this is great, people are coming down here, white folks finally coming down here to support what we're doing, or, or, or identifying with our suffering. So that's not a mass strike in the way that you're thinking of it as low, uh, related to the traditional workplace, right? But it is a kind of mass strike, right? And I think Luxembourg would say, okay, it doesn't fit exactly the conditions that I was living in in 1898 in Germany, but what do you expect? History stands still. Uh, capitalism has different modalities and forms of expression and it, it evolves. And these rallies, by the way, became very much an organizing campaign against the re against the non-availability of services over COVID, including workers who are uh, planning strikes about the fact that they're going to work and they're not getting proper uh, you know, care shown to them because of the COVID situation. That was part of what people were speaking out about in the rallies and trying to meet people and organize around those issues. Uh, yes, there's no political party as such that is even in a position uh, to influence these events. And that may be a good thing because uh, 
the one thing I was worried about from the very beginning is, oh my gosh, well, the Democratic Party is going to come down there. What? But you know, we don't have that kind of a party in the United States. The Democratic Party is not a membership group. For three or four, the first months of the demonstrations, I never saw a single person handing out a leaflet for a Democratic Party candidate. I never saw a single Biden sign, even though everybody, of course, was against Trump. I never, you would not have known a presidential election was going to be held in a couple of months. People were just beyond that. They were not thinking in terms of that. They were thinking and going way beyond that. So, yes, we do need organization and we do need parties and we do need to continue the struggle beyond that spontaneous moment. Uh, but the parties have to learn from that. And so uh, we're having this debate in the United States now where some people are saying that, well, mutual aid and this kind of stuff, that's just social work. That's not really important. But I'll tell you the most important thing that was striking right away about these protests. You know, you, I've gone to a lot of protests in my life. I'm not as much of a spring chicken as I look. But the point of the matter is that um, you go to a rally, you march around, you chant, you know, people make a speech, you applaud, and you go home, and you wake up the next morning and say, and what did that do? Okay. You would show up at these rallies, and these kids would just have themselves organized. I'd say kids, young activists, walking around, giving out masks, giving out water, making, you know, uh, tamales and veggie and meat, whatever, and non-veggie, and say, hey, anybody needs some food, any assistance, if you have medical issues, if you have to get into legal trouble, we have a committee that's going to handle that and bail you out of jail. There was just this sense of community. This is like, you know, it was just a sense of, of, of communal solidarity I've never experienced in my life at, at, at a political event. And it was from the very first event. It was just so striking. It was a qualitative, different texture. And this went on for a long time. So, I mean, yes, um, we can, Luxembourg would love this. <laughs> she was a humanist. <laughs> How could she not have been thrilled about something like this? And I think, frankly, if she was alive today, I think she'd rethink some of her economic theories based on such realities as, you know, well, okay, we're living in a world that's pretty much thoroughly capitalist. So how do you square that with this capitalism versus non-capitalist sectors uh, in the accumulation of capital? She was willing to rethink a lot of her ideas under the impulse of the 1905 revolution, the 1918 German revolution, et cetera. She was attuned to what comes from below. We've got one last question in the talk, uh, in the chat rather, that I think you can answer quickly. So I'm going to slip it in before we finish here. Uh, um, Peter, thanks so much for your great talk. Little question, is there a publication mm -hmm. in which you wrote about your view on the connection between slash independence of class domination, racism and sexism and capitalism? Uh, well, this is, uh, there's an essay I did in the Historical Materialism in 2018, volume 26, number two, uh, where I developed that argument. Uh, historical Materialism is also publishing a special issue on race and class. Uh, it's a journal that's published out of England. And so I have an essay on the issue of beyond the binaries of race and class, which has just been submitted like a week ago to that special issue. Uh, I would be glad to, uh, I'll type in my email address. And if anybody just wants to contact me, because I got quite a few other things written on this. Uh, it's the subject of my next book, actually, uh, is um, Racism and the Logic of Capital. So um, feel free to write me, and I will uh, be glad to uh, send some of my material to you. And I do, of course, discuss this in my book on Fanon. And I also discuss uh, not so much the race dimension, but my, book on Mar but my book on Marx tries to look at his critique of value production and um, uh, the nature of capitalism and the logic of capitalism. And, and what that has to suggest about a liberatory post-capitalist society. So uh, that's also gonna be drawn into some of this work on race that I'm doing. But I would recommend certainly the historical materialism piece in volume 26, number two, on uh, which has the title, Racism and the Logic of Capital. Great, thanks uh, Peter for an incredible uh, presentation and thanks everybody watching for some great questions and a really uh, engaging conversation. Uh, I just posted um, uh, uh, the link to Peter's article in the Facebook chat. So anyone who wants to read further on the subject can do so uh, as soon as we finish this live stream here. Um, uh, thanks to everybody again. It's been a fantastic two days. Uh, uh, I can't believe it's already over, um, but I think we uh, did the best we could uh, to honor uh, Rosa Luxemburg's uh, political spirit and um, intellectual courage and legacy. And uh, like I said at the beginning of this talk, if you want to watch any of these videos,
and they're all on our papers as we can. Thank you again to everyone for a fantastic conference and have a great weekend. And, and thank you, Lauren, for your great work in organizing this. It wouldn't have happened without you. Thank you very much. And everybody else in the world, the Luxembourg Stiftung.